I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome once again to the sharing of God's Word. I believe that this day the Lord will speak to us and build us up as we continually build ourselves in the most holy faith in our pursuit of conforming to Christ, the one and only standard set by the Father, that you and I can become like Him on earth. Today I want to share about what I'm calling discerning God's heart in the midst of a crisis. Designing God's heart in the midst of a crisis. And uh, I do not want to attempt to finish the whole of this sharing today. I will endeavor to communicate a few thoughts to you. And if we finish, praise the Lord, if we don't finish, then we can pick it up again next weekend. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our precious and loving Father, we are grateful to you for allowing us the privilege of sitting under your word, the privilege of sitting under your voice to hear your word. The entrance of your word brings light. We ask Heavenly Father as we hear your word, we will be built, we will be edified, we will be strengthened, we will be built up, and we more like you will become. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we pray and ask that your Spirit will speak to us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, even to speak to us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to impart upon us the very life of God and to build us up in every way. We submit ourselves to you today. And as your word comes through, may our hearts and minds and bodies be healed. And may our hearts be drawn closer to God more and more. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen designing God's heart in the midst of a crisis. You do know, like I do know, that we are in the midst of a crisis globally. You know, there is uh, what we are calling the COVID-19 pandemic. But in the midst of all this, we must be set to hear the voice of God and to know what is God saying. And I want to draw from a story in uh, the Bible that will help us to relate to where we are today and believe, brothers and sisters, that God will speak to us. Let's turn to uh, First Chronicles chapter number 21. First Chronicles chapter number 21. And you can find the story again in uh, Second Samuel chapter number 24, but I want us to go to chapter number 21 today. First Chronicles chapter number 21. I'm going to do this as slowly as I can, so that I can easily communicate. It says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Jacob and to the leaders of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan. Bring the number of them to me, that I may know. And Job answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my servants? Uh, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Interestingly, verse 4 says, Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Job departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And of course, from there on he goes to uh, count. And you can read the whole story. We are going to look at the discourse of the whole story right to the last verse where the whole plague is stopped and uh, the will of God prevails up to verse 30. I want to encourage you to take time and read that story, please, if you can. It's good for you to take time and read that whole chapter. Now the chapter opens with Satan stirring up pride in David and stirring him to number Israel. Verse 1 says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Can you see, to begin with, that Satan is against the whole nation of Israel. And when he's against the nation of Israel, 
he is standing up against the whole of Israel. He stirs up the leader, the principle of representation. So when he stirs up the leader, he knows he will get all the people. That's why it is important for you and I, number one, to be connected to the right kind of leadership, and then number two, to continually pray for and support our leaders, because if the leader gets it wrong, then the people will also get it wrong. He says, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David. David was the king. David was the leader of Israel. You see? But because Satan wants to get even with Israel, he's after the whole nation of Israel. What does he do? He moves David the king. He incites, he stirs up David the king. He seduces the king. Uh, the Hebrew word for that word, uh, star, uh, starring, would mean all those things, seducing, enticing, moving, you know, uh, so that he can get even with the whole of Israel. It's very interesting how we take the matters of uh, leadership lightly and how we have no time to think about our leaders at any level. But I want to encourage you to learn to pray for leaders at every level. Paul exhorts us actually to pray even for leaders in the government because they are there by God's will and God has allowed them to be there to serve a certain purpose, which is very important. When leaders get it wrong, people will get it wrong. Take it from me, my friend. It is of paramount importance for you to commit yourself to both pray for and support your leader in whichever way that God helps you. Why? So that your leader can remain so strongly connected with God. And, and as, we, as we conclude the story, you will see how God himself also goes for the leader. And by going for the leader, he saves the whole of the nation. So again, you see, Satan goes for the leader and destroys the whole nation. God goes for the leader. And when God has a leader, God has a nation. Very powerful principles. They're the principle of representation. And so Satan moves David to number Israel, that is a census. Now, it cannot be, brothers and sisters, that taking a census in Israel was in itself a sin against God. Because God had previously uh, numbered, I mean, uh, asked Moses to take a census of Israel. This had happened in Exodus chapter number 30, verse 12. Exodus 30, verse 12, and it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. So it is God who told Moses to number them, but then of course he goes ahead and tells him after numbering them, they need to give an offering so there will be no plague among them. You know, uh, because these people are not supposed to depend on their own strength. And God knew that once they know how many they are, the possibility of pride coming in uh, is very high. Once you know the number that you have, you see, the strength of numbers very easily evokes pride in a man. And then the man begins to feel how powerful and strong he is because he has numbers. And so God says, after you have numbered them, they must give an offering, and this will be a testimony. They will be simply declaring our trust is not in the numbers that we have discovered we are. Our trust is not in our numbers. Our strength is not in our numbers, and our victory does not come from our numbers. Our victory, our strength is in the Lord, and that's why they had to finally, after getting the numbers, they had each one of them give a ransom, every one of them give a sacrifice, to the Lord as a testimony that their faith was in the Lord, not in their numbers. So, in, again in chapter number one uh, of Numbers, Numbers chapter one, verse one to three, we see God again talking to Moses uh, about a uh, census. It says, now, Numbers chapter one, from verse one to three, now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of meeting, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel, by their families, by their house, father's houses, according to the number of names, every male individually, from 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. Again, you see, God is telling Moses to number the children of Israel. 
He gives very clear, specific instructions. They have to be 20 years and above. All right. So God wants them when they are strong and energetic. And he says, I want them for purpose of a, a war. I want them to be an army that can go to war. So again, God is showing them, it is me who has chosen who will go to war. It is me who will use them in the war. So if they have victory, again, it has come from me. And so God here moves Moses to do a census or to number the children of Israel. The distinction between the census by these two uh, servants of God is in their motive. It's very, very important. Moses is moved by God. And so the purpose was to serve God. David is moved by Satan, and so the purpose was to gratify self. If you remember what we read in 30, uh, number Exodus 30, verse number 12, that God is saying these people, have, after you have counted them, after you number them, let them bring an offering so that there will be no plague. So what is God telling Moses here? After you number them, I want them to also declare that their strength is not in themselves, in their numbers, but in God. So there is a way that numbers gives man some self-confidence, some false confidence in one's self-trust. Numbers can take away from God. Look at someone who, you know, who when numbers change, you know, someone who didn't have a lot of money, suddenly they have, uh, they can handle hundreds of thousands, they can have uh, hundred millions. Something changes. Their trust in God gets altered at some point. Look at someone who is earning in their hundreds. Another one earning in their ten, uh, thousands and tens of thousands. The more numbers increase, faith somehow falters. The ability to put unquestionable trust in God is faltered because man has a way of turning away from God when numbers become big and the numbers give man false confidence. I want to tell you today, let your trust be in God, not in your numbers. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, back to David. After great victories, prosperity and peace that God had given Israel, there's a great possibility that both the king and the people had slackened in their godliness and confidence towards God. And there's a possibility that pride had taken over among God's own people. You see, God had given David a lot of victories. Israel had prospered this time under David's rule. Israel is enjoying peace under David's rule. David has conquered nations greater than him. David has conquered kings greater than him. Numbers mightier than they were. David has had victory after victory. Now, there is a possibility by the time now this uh, chapter is being written, or this particular time, and this is uh, in the latter years of David's life, there's a possibility that both David and the people are slackened in, in godliness and their confidence toward God. And now there is pride among the people, God's own people. You know, now they begin to feel like they have accomplished it by their own ability and power. They begin to feel like it was by their own strength. They begin to feel like they knew. They, they begin to feel like they had the skill. They had forgotten it is God who gave them the victory. No wonder David wants, you know, uh, to know the numerical strength of his army. Thereby now taking his eyes from the God who gave him victory after victory to the arm of flesh. And this is what now is arousing the anger of the Lord. You see, uh, in, in, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter number 24, the story talks about that God moved David to number Israel because he was angry with them. It, it's not really ideally uh, that God incited David to number Israel because if it is that literally taken, then it would mean that God can lead man to sin against him. And you see, God does not lead you to sin. God does not tempt you. God has no capacity or ability to lead you to sin. But it is clarified here. What happened is God was angry with David, possibly because of their complacency and because of their you know, the slackening in godliness and confidence toward him. And so he and David suddenly could be having an inner, a hidden confidence in his army. In, you know, a hidden confidence in the numbers that he now has and the prospect of Israel. And because he's having confidence in the numbers, and so Satan is the one who has already ins inspired David to trust the numbers. And so God allows Satan to incite David to count 
the people. So you see, it is not really God who made David do it, but God allowed Satan to incite David to do it. And so David now is beginning to put his trust in the wrong place. Verse number two says, So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me. Why? That I may know it. That's all. There's nothing else he wants. There's no purpose. There's no war. There's, it's not because I want them to offer sacrifice to God. It's not because I want this, there's an agenda. No, I just want to know it. Bring me the number so that I can know it. I want to know how many men I have in the battle. Anytime you hear a census of this kind taken in the Bible day, they were actually counting men, and the number was to know how many can go for battle. The kings would measure their strength in that way. And so David, like any other king, wants to measure his strength, wants to know how many men do I have who can go for war. And you see, Joab is trying to sober him up and says, no, 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 my Lord, may God multiply people more and more. In other words, you don't have to know the number. God always gives you victory irrespective of the number. Praise the name of the Lord. And I want to assure you, beloved child of God, God will always give you victory irrespective of the numbers. God does not work with the numbers. It is you who works the numbers, the number of your, the figure of your salary and all these kind of things, the number of the people in the congregation. It is you who looks at that. God does not work with the numbers. He is God. He's sovereign. He can give you victory by a few or by many. And that is what uh, uh, we learn in the Bible. And so, uh, 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 in, in fact, it's Jonathan who said that, that God can save by many or by few. And so what happens here? David's commander uh, uh, tries to dissuade him from doing that. He tries to show David the wrong thing, you know. But David commands them. The Bible says that the command of David prevailed over Joab. So David's command to number Israel was out of pride and vain glory. You see, self-confidence and pride in his own strength. These, these things had blinded him and had made him to forget the source of all his strength and victories, the almighty God. Now he wants to know, he wants to see how strong am I? What is my strength? What is my power? I want to measure myself. I want to measure myself as a king. I want to know where I stand as a king. David technically now is taking his faith from God to his own men, to the arm of flesh. This is called independence from God. What you call pride is independence from God. Now this independence from God, which is common among men, is probably what angered God. And he allowed Satan to incite David to take a census so that God can show David that his own strength and the strength of his own army is nothing for him to depend on. And so God now sets a stage for him to humble David. He sets a stage to show David, you cannot depend on your army. You cannot depend on your men. You cannot depend on your own arm of strength. He, want, he's, he sets a stage now to show David that this is called pride. It is independence from God. It is simply reliance on your own strength, reliance on your own ability. You see, friends, brothers and sisters, when God has given you victory after victory, when God has prospered you and given you peace on all sides, humble yourself. When you stand and all others around you are falling, humble yourself. When you are strong spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and even materially, but all others look weak to you, humble yourself. When your marriage seems like it is stable and firm, but you can point to tens of other marriages that have strife, strife and trouble and the winds are beating them, humble yourself. Humble yourself. When your husband is those kind of gentle men and calm and cool and, and you think and you thank God for him, but you, 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 know, you can point at other men and almost scorn them because of how they are, humble yourself. When your children are obedient, when your children are cooperative to you, when your children are obeying your instructions as a parent, humble yourself. Don't point your finger at other children. 
Don't say that, uh, you know, those children are like this and that. You wish, no, no, no. Don't point a finger. Humble yourself. When you see yourself going up, humble yourself. God has given you a job, has given you, humble yourself. When you have prayed and, and God has answered your prayer, it is not time for you to blow your trumpet. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. When God has given you favor. Suddenly you can be trusted by men and women. Suddenly you can talk to people of influence. Beloved, humble yourself. Always remember, it is good. You see, humility is simply acknowledging that it is not you who is doing it. It is not your strength or expertise or skill or experience. It's simply acknowledging it is the hand of the Lord. Hallelujah. It is the hand of the Lord. That's what humility is about. But pride is simply when you take the glory from the Lord and place it elsewhere. If I didn't have money, I would not have succeeded in that. If I didn't have a master's degree, I would not have succeeded. If I did know that person, I would not. All these things are not bad, but they are not what gave you victory. They could be tools God used, but ultimately, it's God who gave you victory. So humble yourself. Never take your eyes off the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Meaning you have your own understanding. It says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never at one time take your trust away from him. And this is, brothers and sisters, not easy. Because we, have, we live in a system where anything else deserves our trust except God. You see, we live in a physical realm and everything is physical around us. We live in a realm where we can touch, feel, and see. We have the four common, five common senses. And so we tend to put our faith on that which agrees with the five senses. What we can, what we can see, what we can hear, what we can touch, what we can taste, what we can smell. These things are, are you know, are real. And so to put our faith in this invisible God becomes so big of a challenge. But let me charge you today, irrespective of what you see in the physical, irrespective of what you see in the natural, it is unreliable. The natural has its source as the spirit. The visible is from the invisible. All life is spiritual. That which you see now and that you can handle, God spoke it into existence. And so he, he is wise who chooses to put his trust on him who is invisible. The reality is in the spirit realm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Put your faith and complete reliance on God. James chapter 4 verse 6 to 7 the Bible says, But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. And you can see that's what is happening to David. David, a man after God's own heart. But when he set himself up in pride, God simply allowed Satan to uh, incite him. It's like God with, withdrew his hand from him because of pride. God hates pride. You have to hate pride. And, and some of you talk too much about yourself. Everything is I. Everything is I. You know, I things. I and I. I want you to begin listening to yourself from today and hear how much time you talk I. You'll be amazed at how much you are drunk with yourself. You'll be amazed at how much drunk you are with yourself. Everything is I. You know, and, and, and a sentence cannot end before you bring yourself in the equation. You cannot finish explaining something before you in the equation. And where there seems to be glory that can be given somewhere, you have to take that glory. Brothers and sisters, humble yourself. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, when you always want to take glory, it means you're independent from God. Therefore, submit to God, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. This is a very, very profound thing. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. 
not in the sight of men. Men can think. You see, you can deceive us. We can think you are humble. But it says humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. For God does not look like men look. God does not see like men see. God sees the heart. You can play humble. But playing humble is not being humble. It's amazing that how many people are experts of playing humble. We have many people who know how to play humble today. But brothers and sisters, playing humble does not make you humble. You've got to come to the point where you humble yourself. Don't even let your knowledge make you puffed up. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Sometimes we feel like we know too much. You know, like I'm, I'm a preacher. Sometimes we, we feel like I'm a better preacher. I have a better understanding of the scripture. I'm a better of the scriptures than so and so. I have a better command of scriptures. I have a better understanding. I can interpret these things better. Brothers and sisters, when you have revelation, God has opened your eyes to see something that another one has not seen. Humble yourself. And this humility must be in the sight of God. God resists the proud. I don't want to go to the big extent of belabeling that word resist, but it's a very strong word which carries the idea of setting himself to oppose you. It's like God organizing himself to oppose you, the Greek meaning of that word. God organizing himself, setting himself, positioning himself to resist you, to oppose you. Now, you don't want to be in a position where God is setting himself up to oppose you. I can't afford that. Humble yourself. Pride is independence from God. Simply defined. In the simplest definition of pride. Pride is independence from God. Where you think you can depend on yourself. Right? Pride is independence from God. And reliance on your own strength. When you talk about strength here. Relying on your own strength. You are talking about your intellectual strength. Your spiritual strength your material strength, your physical strength, your social strength, the connections you have, you know, because you have connections, you, you don't think some things you need to trust God, you have connections, you just know who to talk to, you know who to call where, you have all those connections. You are bright, you are sharp, you, are, you can understand these things, you, you have come to the point of relying on your own intelligence, you know, you, you think you are spiritually up, up to date, your spiritual aptitude and capacity and stamina and strength become the source of pride. Now you even trust your own spirituality than God himself. Your material capacity makes you trust God. I mean, makes you trust it than trusting God. That's pride. Pride is independence from God and relies on your own strength. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, never separate your success and victories from God. Keep your mind on him who is the source of all strength. Whatever you do and you succeed, whatever you do and you achieve, whatever you do and your victory, never ever separate your success and victories from God. Why? God resists the proud. You see, when you take your victory from God, when you separate your victory from God, it means you own the victory. You give, you own, you take the credit for the victory. Because he did not give it to you you are the one who took it by yourself. That simply means you take it from him to yourself. So you, you are the one who has the glory. You are the one who has the praise. You are the one who has the honor. You help to yourself. You see? So you are simply now relying on your own strength and not on God. Keep your mind on him who is a source of all strength. Do not for one moment live your life independent of God, brothers and sisters. No matter how much you succeed in life. No matter how much you exert, always remember it is the Lord who has brought you this far. It is the grace of God at work in you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is not by your power. It is not by your mind. It is by the Spirit of the Lord. And so with these uh, alarming levels of independence from God that is evident among men today, because, uh, because I'm telling you there is such a levels of independence in the society it's alarming. And with this kind of alarming levels of independence from God, then it is not a perfect thought that God has given men over to their own prideful lusts. And Satan has incited many to do things that can only arouse the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Our own pride is destroying us, brothers and sisters. Our own pride. We think we can do it without God. 
And the result is we are destroying our own environment. We are destroying the world that God has given us because of our own pride. Proverbs 11 verse 2 says what? When pride comes, then comes shame. Proverbs 11 verse 2. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. We are lacking in wisdom because we do not know how to humble ourselves. Until you come to place and accept it to work in humility, there's a level of wisdom you can never access. You see, when you humble yourself before God, God himself releases grace to you. In this grace is the wisdom of God. But when we walk in the pride we are walking in, then we can be ready for shame. Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18, the Bible says, Pride goes before destruction. And the Holy Spirit before I fall. That's what we always say, pride comes before I fall. Pride goes before destruction. Look at how the things are in the world. Look at the, the, the level and the extent of destruction in the world. This is because of pride. And what is pride? Pride is independence from God and relies upon our own strength. We have, we have stopped relying upon God. We have stopped depending on God. We have become independent of Him. Now we are relying on our own selves. So hence the destruction, the wanton destruction. Proverbs 29 verse 23. This a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. There's an honor that comes when you humble yourself before God. There's honor in humility. After all, humility is not a bad thing. There's honor in humility. But it says a man's pride will bring him low. Pride will bring us low, brothers and sisters. Is it then a wonder that we have crisis after crisis all over the world? Look at what is happening. A myriad of crises around the world. It's only that we are talking of COVID-19. I am telling you things have, things have been tough in the last few years world over. Civil wars, food insecurity and hunger, terrorism and militia group attacks, global warming, and now the coronavirus, to name but a few. All these point to something. Man is independent from God. Whichever way you look at it, these and many more are as a result of man's independence from God. We are too proud to trust God and to live according to his design for us. Man is too proud to trust God and live according to God's design for him and the entire creation. You see, God has a design that is the pattern that is divine, that is heavenly, a pattern for which man is supposed to conform to, a pattern by which man is supposed to live, a design that is meant for the life of man. But for you to live by divine design, you must humble yourself. You must agree. You must depend on God. You see? But we feel we know. We think we know. That's what is happening. We are destroying the very world, the very earth that God has given us. Heaven of the heaven, heaven belongs to God, but the earth has given the sons of men. We are destroying the same earth today. Why? We have chosen the path of independence from God. You'll be seeing as we go along with the story, and I'm sure we can't finish this today, next week possibly. You'll be seeing as we go along with this story, how that David, the, the, the tragedy that befell Israel. Why? Because they became independent of God. Pride set in. My friend, you talk of pandemic that we are having in. What you will see happening in Israel next week, as we share on, on next week, what you will see will shock you and you realize what has happened in the last six months with COVID-19 on planet Earth is nothing compared to what happened in Israel within three days. All this because of their independence from God. It seems to me, brothers and sisters, that man, uh, it seems to me like man have been, men, you know, men have been incited by Satan to count their wealth. You see, David was incited to count the people because it is from the people that David thought was going to drive significance and worth and value and identity and fame and name. These are things David wanted. You see, when, 
we turn from God, when we come, become independent of God, then we become, then we become obsessed with fame, with with praise of men, with significance before men, with how we look and how men define us, we so now we become preoccupied with ourselves. And it seems to me like men have been incited by Satan to count their wealth. You know, there's a crazy obsession in people to acquire and amass wealth without the slightest regard for human dignity. And I believe this is why we are having them alarming, mind-boggling, and heartbreaking levels of corruption, witchcraft, violence, and oppression among men. It's like there's a rush to number our wealth. Everybody wants to accumulate as much as I can, as fast as I can. Why? Because the more I have, the more famous I am, the, the more popular I become. All right? So we suddenly we have this thing I call the celebrity syndrome. It's a disease that has beaten us in the society. Everyone wants to be a celeb, even in your own office. You want to be, to be the one who seems to be more popular. You want to be seen to drive the best car. You want to be seen to have the best hairstyle. You want to be seen to have the best shoe, the best dress, the best suit. You want to be seen to have the best handbag. You want to be seen you know, to have the best English. You want to be seen to be the best in every way. You see... Uh, we, we are in the business of outshining one another. I want to be the celeb, even in church now. Everything is about celebrity uh, syndrome. It's popularity. We want our church to be the most popular. We want our pastor to be the most popular. Our choir is the most popular. This and that, the most popular. I'm not in these games of popularity. I'm not in the kingdom. I'm not in the preaching for popularity. I don't seek it. I don't need it. I don't look for it. I am here to do God's will. For me, if I know that I have communicated the mind of God, that satisfies me. Like Jesus said, I am here to do the will of my Father. You do well to know that Jesus never sought popularity in his day. Jesus never sought popularity. And every genuine son of God, the first thing that you break away from is the desire for fame. And popularity. As long as you want to be famous, it tells you there's a law that needs to be worked on in your life. And David suddenly now is caught up with this thing. David now suddenly wants fame and popularity. He wants to be great among the other kings. But how can he become that? By knowing the numbers. When he knows the numbers, then he knows the numbers of others. Then he can give their numbers. Then others will fear David because of his numbers. But up to this point, they fear David because of his God. David has forgotten that, that God gave him victory. Now he's going to numbers. Beloved, put your trust in God, not in numbers. Stop dying to be sick. Don't die to be rich. Don't die to have wealth. Stop fighting for material things. Don't die to be famous. Don't die to be popular. You do the will of God. Lay your life down to serve God and to serve his will. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Don't envy anyone. Don't be jealous about what others have. Rejoice in the blessing of others. Don't only think about yourself. Don't be caught up in the rush to number your wealth. And I know that many of us are here. We are, we are at the point of numbering our wealth. That's why we are so concerned even about figures. You know, what I am earning and what another one is earning. Figures. Because we want to number our wealth. There's a crazy obsession in people to acquire and amass wealth. And so in the process of that, people have no care about one another. That's why we have these kind of uh, people doing all sorts of things. People are resorting to witchcraft to become wealthy, to become popular, to become famous. Corruption at alarming levels. What's happening? We want to number our wealth. Satan has incited men to number their wealth. So that in those numbers, they can find their strength. So there's a rush to number our wealth. That which gives us identity, worth, significance, prominence, you know, greatness. That which makes us to, to be significant among others. That which gives us recognition among others. Yet all of it is false. It's false identity. It's false value. It's for, for significance. It is force. 
can never be trusted. Men and women have been incited by Satan and have put their confidence in their own power and might away from God and his strength and wisdom. This is the pride that caught up with David and he had to number his men of war. David had to flex his muscles and know how strong he was. This is the mistake that David made. And David opened a door for such a plague to invade Israel, a plague of untold magnitude. Now, I would wish to press on further, but because of time, I want to just put a comma on this one today so that you can begin to think about this. I want us to just begin to think about the issue of pride and humility. The issue of pride and humility. The issue of us numbering our, numbering our wealth. I want us to go to the point where you can begin to think about how much are you numbering your wealth? Where are you finding your confidence? Where are you finding your trust? How much faith do you have in Him? That's what I want us to begin thinking about. We began by establishing the mistake that David made. Before we can go on and begin to establish how God responded to that, we are establishing the mistake that David made. Brothers and sisters, I don't think I would want us to make such a mistake nowadays. I don't want us to be caught up in pride. I don't want us to be caught up counting on our wealth. Counting up that which you can put a trust in. I want you to lift your eyes to God. Put your trust and faith in God. Put your hope in Him. Let your value, let your worth, let your significance, let everything about you be anchored on God. Put your trust in Him, brothers and sisters. In Proverbs chapter number 3, verse 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct you. I know I've gone very slowly in this, but I want us to take this journey very slowly until we can discern the mind of God in the midst of a crisis. And then come the point where we are rightly positioned. There's a resetting taking place on earth, brothers and sisters. And as God is resetting things in the world and on earth, I want you to be rightly positioned also that you can do what God wants you to do. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Heavenly Father, we humble our hearts to you. The entrance of your heart brings light. And ask Lord that you speak to our hearts more and more. Let your light shine. Let your light illuminate us, O oh God. Cause us to see ourselves in your light. Let no ounce of pride remain in us, Heavenly Father. Shake it up. Destroy it completely. Uproot it from its core. Every seed of pride. Uproot it from its core. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us to come to the place of humility in the sight of the Father. Humility in the sight of God. Not in the sight of man. Father, we thank you today. That our trust is not in these things that are visible, that are temporal, that are natural, and that are earthly. Our trust is in you. Thank you, Father. And so, beloved, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Let goodness and mercy follow you the days of your life. Walk in the path of humility. And may the grace of the Lord be multiplied to you now and always. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.